Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Consumer CLE. I am Catherine Saldana, Mentor Attorney with the Dallas Volunteer Attorney Program. Our program handles a variety of cases. The consumer issues that we commonly see at DVAP are roof repairs, cars, tote the notes, car repairs, that sort of thing. We are fortunate to have Kelly, Kendall Kelly Hayden, a member with Cousin O'Connor, as our speaker today. Kendall focuses uh, her practice primarily in commercial litigation with an emphasis in transportation and hospitality law. She received her Bachelor of Arts in Spanish from Texas A&M University and her law degree in 2003 from SMU Dedman School of Law. In 2012, Kendall was recognized uh, by the Dallas Volunteer Attorney Program as the Pro Bono Coordinator of the Year. Since 2004, Kendall has volunteered with the Dallas Volunteer Attorney Program. She is our go-to expert in consumer issues and continues to also represent DVAP clients in some of our more complex consumer cases. And let uh, Kendall continue with her program. Thank you. Oh, Thanks, Kathy. Oh, I'm sorry. One more thing I forgot. Uh, please hold your questions until after the presentation. Thank you, Kathy. So um, I really am excited to be here, and I just want you to know that I am um, very cognizant of time, so I will not keep you over. I find that to be very annoying during speaking presentations. So if you see me looking over here, I'm looking at my stopwatch on my phone. Um, and I'll, I'll give you kind of a little bit of overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, essentially, I kind of fell into doing consumer law cases and I have a lot of fun with them and I um, really only do them with DVAP. And so this, because we are in COVID-19, I thought we should learn 19 tips, tricks, and tales about Texas consumer law that hopefully will get you interested in taking a case from DVAP. Um, and even if you can't take one from DVAP, you know, maybe this will give you a little bit of background if you do take on a consumer law uh, case in your own career. So this is a little bit of background of what we're gonna be learning about today. You'll see that I have a lot of references to bad B movies. And that is because consumer law cases are so fun that they are often like a bad B movie. And so the bad B movies we're gonna be hearing about today are actually cases I've handled myself um, and clients that I have represented myself through DVAP. And I will give you their names and everything so that you can have a full picture of how much fun these cases can be. One thing you should know in terms of consumer law is that there is an uptick, um, which by the word, I don't think I, by the way, I never used the word uptick until COVID-19 and I feel that I use that word all the time now. Um, but there is truly an uptick in consumer law cases that the FTC has warned um, the community about. There are scam callers trying to coax people into work at home schemes. There are different types of things being done to encourage you to buy low cost health insurance during COVID. So I think that we're gonna see more consumer law claims specifically just because of what's going on with COVID. So keep that in mind. So why do you care about what I have to say about consumer law? Well, I will tell you that I first um, got into consumer law back in 1997, which was before I was in law school. And I was actually working for Gib Walton, who some of you may know as our former State Bar of Texas president, who's unfortunately now deceased. Um, but I was working as a, what I would consider lowly summer intern. And that means I basically was summarizing depositions. And I thought that was thrilling, by the way, but Gib Walton, um, I did not know who he was at the time. At the time, he was a partner at Vincent and Elkins, and he sent out an email to the entire firm in Houston, which is where I was working, and said, does anybody speak Spanish? And not knowing any better and being sort of fearless, I said, well, I do. And so I marched my intern self down to his office to find out that he was the president at the time of the Houston Bar Association and that he needed this manual that you're looking at translated into Spanish. And so um, I actually worked under him the entire summer and I translated the consumer law handbook for the Houston Bar Association into Spanish for him and for the Houston Bar Association. And so this is what it looks like. It's still in existence to this day. So I started learning about consumer law, um, not only in English, but in Spanish in 1997. And um, as I shared with you at the time, Gib Walton was the president of the Houston Bar Association. He went on to become the president of the Texas State Bar and actually wrote my recommendation to go to law school. So that's also a good lesson for you never know who you're going to be working for. 
By trade, I am a defense attorney. I work for Cozen O'Connor, where I have worked since I was a summer associate in 2002. And I do consumer law claims on the defense side, but that's really not the primary part of my practice. As Kathy told you, my specialty is transportation and hospitality law. Um, but I do like consumer claims. Uh, I also handle consumer class action claims. And so um, my, my, my experience is, was somewhat limited when I started working with DVAP. Um, the reason that I do consumer law cases with DVAP and the reason why I started um, is not only because I speak Spanish and oftentimes there is a need for a bilingual attorney, but also because as a commercial litigator who started out as an insurance coverage lawyer, I did not get any trial experience the first part of my career. And so I want a trial experience and consumer law cases um, are fun and oftentimes lend themselves to trials. So after doing this um, for you know, I would say maybe 10 times, uh, DVAP asked me if I would be the mentoring attorney or a mentoring attorney for consumer law cases. And of course I happily said yes. So um, the other thing you should know about my law firm is that we have what's called a state attorney's general practice. And what that means is that when the attorney general of a state is investigating a business, our law firm comes in to defend the business. And so for that reason, I have some, you know, other types of working knowledge of consumer law. But the point of me saying all that is that you do not need any experience to handle these cases. I'm gonna teach you what you need to know right now. So do not think that there is any kind of expertise required. So let's talk about bad B movies. Um, I cannot make these things up. I did not make them up. These are true stories, real clients. And our first bad B movie is about who I call Rico Suave. Um, Rico Suave was the, his name is actually Rico, not Rico Suave, but he was the used car sales manager at a car dealership here in town. My client um, wanted to help her sister out because her sister had bad credit. And so my client, Latoya Smith, said to the car dealership, I would like to buy a car for my sister and I'd like to co-sign with her. At which point Rico said, well, you can't co-sign with her. You are the only person who can sign. Your credit's better, her credit's crap. You have to sign. And so she thought about it and she went home and she realized that that was not a good idea. Um, she had lost her job and she was afraid that she would not be able to make um, the payment. So she went back to the car dealership the next day and said, I've lost my job. I really don't think this is a good idea. It's not good timing. And Rico ignored her and said, um, and I'm quoting, um, you are a blessing to your sister and God will reward you by being a blessing to your sister if you buy this car for her. She said, you know, I really just, I just don't think it's a good idea and I really don't wanna do it. Um, he said, oh, don't worry. We will get the contract changed out of your name into your sister's name after six months and we'll get her credit all cleared up. And so, you know, God will just reward you for being such a blessing if you do this deal. So she thought about it some more and went home and came back the following day. So this is now the second day after she um, signed the contract. I'm sorry, I left that very important fact out. She signed the contract. Um, and so we're now on day two after she signed the contract and she returns to the dealership again and says, you know, I just really don't think this is a good idea. And she leaves the keys on Rico's desk. Rico, of course, is nowhere to be found. One month later, um, she gets a phone call from the dealership saying, your tags are in. And she said, well, I gave you the keys back and I asked you to get me out of the contract. And essentially, I looked at the contract. Um, it was in fact signed and I did not think there was a way to get out of it, but I did think that there was a lot of representations that were made to her that were shady, shall we say. So um, I called her bank. They were not interested in getting her out of the note. I called the dealership, not interested in getting her out of the contract. And so I sent a very friendly demand letter and uh, shared with the dealership and with the bank all of the misrepresentations that were made and why if they did not void the contract that we would file suit in Dallas County Court. And what do you know, they released her from the contract and she called me and literally screamed hallelujah into the phone. So that is a good example of a happy ending for a bad B movie that I really want you to experience if you take on a consumer law case with DVAP. So here is a tip um, in case you are unfamiliar with consumer law. 
or have never handled a case, essentially the definition of a consumer is somebody who purchases goods or services for their personal use. Now, this is probably my most favorite Bad B movie story because it involves my personal manicurist, and that is actually my nail salon where I went for a very long time. Um, this is not really a consumer case, but I did get the case while doing a consumer thing, getting my nails done. Um, and I think you should just hear this story because it shows how you can help people by doing just a little bit and sharing a little bit of your vast knowledge of the legal world. So I'm getting my nails done, which I do every two weeks, um, like clockwork. And my manicure says to me in kind of broken English that she has some paperwork about a child support order dated in February of 2018 and that her, the father of her child has not paid child support since 2015. And so I said, well, show me the paperwork. Well, what I realized is that she had a hearing coming up in May, um, and that was gonna be the hearing where they issued the final child support order. And I apologize for those of you who are family lawyers. I am not a family lawyer. Um, and so I, I don't know if I'm saying all of the terminology correctly, but the bottom line is, is I had absolutely no experience doing this. And I said, can I go with you to the hearing? Again, walking in cold, totally blind, don't know what I'm doing. Uh, we walk in and I'm sorry for those of you that are criminal lawyers, but like criminal court is scary to me. Family law is court is scarier. I was not prepared for what I saw. Being a mother of a young child myself, I was kind of uh, aghast at how many children, young children are in the courtroom. Um, and so I sat myself in the jury box with some other family law attorneys and I asked them, how do, how do I do this? And so on the fly, I kind of learned what we needed to do. Um, I was able to get the owner of the nail salon, who was my client's mother, excuse me, my client's sister, um, to pull up the 1099s from the father of the child because he also worked at the nail salon. That's actually the first person who ever did my nails there was the father of my client's daughter, or three children rather. Um, and what we realized was that at the previous hearing where she had been awarded a whopping $317, $317 a month, he had been lying about his income. Basically had stated at the hearing that he was only making $9,000 uh, as opposed to $30,000 a year. And anybody who gets their nails done knows that those people make bank. And I knew that he was not making $9,000 and he was a good manicurist. So he was at the hearing as well. And he actually spoke English much better than my own client. And I approached him and I said, do you want to hammer this out now? Or do you want to go into the office with the assistant attorney general and have her ask you the questions? And he refused to admit that he had been lying in the previous hearing. And so we went in to meet with the um, assistant attorney general and she started asking questions and I got him to admit that he was not only lying at the previous hearing but that he did in fact make $30,000 a year and we did have the 1099s and we were just so you know I didn't have exhibits I didn't have a whiteboard I didn't have a PowerPoint I literally had a cell phone of the owner of the salon and the photos on her phone that showed the 1099s so you don't have to be super fancy in these cases a lot of these things um, are, are at your fingertips, literally. And so that's all I did. And she walked out of there. Um, unfortunately for her, her, the father of her three children had lied about how many biological children he had at the pr pr prior hearing, which was why one of, the, one of the reasons why the payments were so low, in addition to lying about his income. But what was gut-wrenching for me to watch was him stating on the record that he had no interest in seeing his three children with her ever again. So while that is hard to see, um, I was thrilled when she was awarded $782 per month that he has to pay her in child support. And I'm happy to say that he has paid it every single month since, which sometimes in these cases you have to, you know, be cognizant that some people can't pay. So a tip, um, educate your client. One of the first things I suggest you do when you get the file in after you run a conflict check, of course, and accepted the case from DVAP is meet with your client. Now, a few months ago, I would have encouraged you to meet face-to-face, -face, but as we all know, um, case in point today, this is a virtual presentation, we're not doing a lot of that anymore. Um, so I would encourage you, if you are comfortable meeting them in person um, and you can't go to your office, because I can't go to my office right now, visitors are not allowed. So you could go to a Starbucks. You could also FaceTime um, your potential pro bono client on the phone. 
I have found that when they put a face to a name um, or a face to a voice, they trust you more. And same thing with them. I think all of us are craving human interaction right now. And so seeing someone's face is sometimes a really uh, comfortable way to start business. Zoom is sometimes not available, obviously, for a lot of these clients. And so while you could do Zoom, um, I'm suggesting FaceTime because it's a little more accessible. So not only educating your client, but educate yourself. So um, I'm sure some of you have experienced boredom during COVID and not trying to be a dork, but read the laundry list um, in the DTPA because it's actually funny. There's a lot of funny sort of statutes and causes of action um, that none of us get to do in our everyday life. And as Kathy pointed out, most of the consumer law cases that DVAP gets are um, car, you know, car issues or somebody, you know, trying to get out of contract or roof repairs, all of which I have handled, by the way. And so um, I have not given you the entire laundry list of the DTPA claims because there are 27 laundry list causes of action, but I have written here or provided here for you the most popular or the most commonly used. In case you're wondering what that blurry image is on the right hand part of my screen, that would be an actual laundry list from a hotel. And um, that's my attempt to be funny, even though you can't see it. So I'm not sure if that was a very good idea. Um, so that you know, under the DTPA, which is probably going to be the most common time that you, or common um, cause of action that you use in a consumer law case, you have to give 60 days notice of suit. So when I send my very friendly demand letters, I always do it 60 days before I file suit. Um, you also have to alert them that you're seeking your attorney's fees. And so one of the reasons why I like using DTPA causes of action when I can find them is because you can argue treble damages, you can also argue attorney's fees. And so that really kind of amps up the damages for your client. Another tip um, is educate your opponent. You know what I love to do is I love to tell the defendant that I am representing a pro bono client, um, ask them what their insurance deductible is, and tell them I have absolutely nothing to lose. And usually that makes people understand that you're serious about this. So it's not like a client that has a budget. There is really no budget here. And so I like telling people that. I think it's important for people to know that you're representing a pro bono client. I think it's important for the judge to also know that you're representing a pro bono client. So I was born in 1976, and therefore one of my favorite video games is Atari Pitfall. Um, <clears throat> I want to share with you some pitfalls that you will probably come into contact with when you have a pro bono consumer law client. They like to sign contracts without reading them, or they sign contracts that they did read, but they didn't understand them. Um, as a bilingual attorney, oftentimes Spanish speakers are signing English contracts that they didn't read and couldn't understand. So um, pitfalls usually revolve around just using common sense, um, but unfortunately, sometimes a lot of these clients are not business savvy. And so what we think of as common sense is something that's sort of something that they don't think about. So for example, issuing a blank check. Again, these are things that have actually happened to my clients. And so that's why I'm sharing them with you. Um, failing to put agreements in writing. I will share with you a bad B movie story about failing to put an agreement in writing. So one of the lawyers I work with, I asked some people in my firm who also take a lot of DVAP cases on, and I said, what would you recommend for taking on a consumer law case? What are some tips that you may have? And some of the lawyers I work with actually had a great idea. We should come up with, and hopefully in DVAP, this is a little bit directed at you, but maybe a, like a common sense do's and don'ts for pro bono attorneys to give to their pro bono clients, kind of as like a closing letter. Like, don't forget in the future, put things in writing, or don't forget in the future, don't issue a blank check, or don't forget in the future, you can't vandalize your husband's car just because you're mad at him. So again, real stories, real people. Um, also, another common sense do note is don't lie to your lawyer. Also happened. So here is probably the most egregious bad B movie story I have for you. And it was so egregious that I had to put it into two PowerPoint um, slides. So I'm just gonna kind of read it out to you. I don't usually like doing that, but it's, it's a lot of information to, for you to read yourself. So essentially my client goes into a car dealership. Uh, her name is Mrs. Meters, by the way, Mary Meters. And she wants to trade in her vehicle. Um, she is told that she is upside down on her equity and that the deal can't be done. 
Now, here's where it gets just real interesting. So at this point, the pre-owned sales manager, probably Rico's cousin, says, oh, I need a car for my son. So here's what we'll do. I'll take your vehicle. I'll transfer the title out of your name into my name, and then I'll take over your car payments. Okay, just so you understand, this is a personal deal that the car sales manager is doing with my client. This is not like a dealership deal. So this is the used car salesman saying, I need a car for myself, so I will go ahead and put the title into my name, I'll take over the payments, you just give me your car. Well, do we think that was in writing? So my client then um, goes along her merry way, gets her trade in, and receives a phone call from her bank saying, did you know that your car was in an accident? Her car number one, let's just for simplicity's sake, old car, trading car. And she said, well, no, my, my car was not in an accident because I don't own that car. And the bank said, well, actually the title and the loan are still in your name um, and no payments have been made. So you're now in default. And so my client who was actually very resourceful, um, who did use common sense actually called and obtained a police report and found out that the son of the pre-owned sales manager had been driving the car at the time of an accident and he was going to buy a cell phone from someone's house. Now, let me ask those of you, how many times have you purchased a cell phone from someone's house? Okay, so now here we are at Bad B Movie number three, part two. The son arrives at the house to collect his cell phone, okay? His friend, his friend is a passenger in the front seat and the friend gets out and accompanies the son into the home. And upon entering the home, a man with a gun shoots and kills the passenger. So this is the son's friend as he's getting back into the vehicle. So the really high quality caring son decides to leave the car in drive, get out of the car and leave his friend as a passenger in the front seat. And so the vehicle then T-bones another vehicle. Okay. So what happens? Well, um, I call the dealership. Um, the dealership, as you might imagine, when I sued them, retained a lawyer, which is actually a good thing in my opinion. Um, and I basically said, you should never have hired this guy. If you look at his rap sheet is what I'm going to call it. Um, I did a background check on the manager. He had had like 25 different thefts, credit card fraud. Now mind you, it was all too old to be admissible but it still shows that perhaps they should have done a better job vetting him. While I was representing Mrs. Meters, I was able to get him fired, so he no longer works there. Um, but I will tell you that he called and sort of threatened me a few times and told me to stop representing her and told me that she was a liar. And um, at the end of the day, to make a long story short, um, I negotiated a settlement with the dealership. And so Ms. Meters, um, and I helped her get her credit kind of straightened back out. Um, but she did walk away with some money in her pocket. So a good ending to a bad B movie and also with some horror aspects to it. Okay, so statute of limitation. Um, again, there's millions of statutes of limitation in Texas. I'm only including the ones that I think are gonna come up in your consumer law cases. The DTPA is actually a two year statute. Now, if you have a tie in to like a breach of contract, um, you may have a four year statute, but remember, generally speaking, it's two years. Fraud is kind of something fun to throw in there once in a while. And sometimes when I have a tort claim and the statute's going to expire or has expired by the time I get the, the, the case, fraud is something you can use to kind of, um, if, of course, if there's evidence of that, um, that has a longer statute of limitation. Breach of contract, well known as four. Trespass, um, I actually had a consumer case for DVAP involving somebody's tree trespassing on somebody's yard. Um, that was fun. And I, I hired an, um, an arborist as my expert. So I did not know that people that dealt with trees were called arborist, which I should know because uh, the word for tree in Spanish is arbol. Uh, but anyway, that was a fun case and trespass is a two year um, statute limitation. Products liability, also two years. Property damage, two years. 
so that you have kind of a little list on um, what you need to be looking at when you first get the case in. A lot of these are old and DVAP does a really great job of kind of vetting the case to make sure that it is not, um, that the statute hasn't run. But, you know, just so you know, those are some things you should look at when you first get your file in. Okay, Bad B movie number four. Okay, this is Gabriella Gomez, who was my client a long time ago, and she had some hail damage on her home. This is not her home. This is just so you can see kind of what it was like. She had hail damage on her roof, and so she hired a roofer who said that they could complete the work in five days. And so the roofer requested a 20% down payment, which she paid. He was supposed to start work on April 1st, and I guess he took April Fool's Day literally because he called and said, I can't come, getting materials, I need more money. And so, good example of bad common sense, she said, sure, here's some money. April 10th, nine days later, I can be there next week, I can't come today, but I need more money. So, common sense error number two, she gives him more money. Um, April 12th, he drops off a trailer with about half the shingles needed for the roof and says, I need more money. Error number three, now she gives him $3,000. April 17th, he shows up and rips off the whole roof, the tar, everything, and creates debris all over the property, nails, I mean, stuff is everywhere. The next day, two workers show up without the contractor. and they said, well, we've never been paid. We were just day laborers, we were picked up um, and he's never paid us. And so we're not going to do the work. April 18th, um, same day it rains. And so there is a gaping hole in her house because the roof is gone. All the interior is damaged. She bought new Sears mattresses, which unfortunately we're never gonna be able to say that in the future, buying mattresses from Sears, considering it's no longer, but she did buy mattresses from Sears and they were ruined, clothes, carpets, um, all different types of things are damaged. And so she called the roofer and said, bring me some tarps, which is what you're looking at. And so he tarped the roof. He left them there for three weeks. Um, they didn't work very well. So damage continued to ensue in her home. And on May 6th, so now we're basically one month and five days after the date that he was supposed to have started the work and we're 30 days the, to the date after the date that he should have finished the work. He said, you're going to have to pay for the materials yourself because I don't have any money. Well, at this point, she has gotten some common sense and she says, I'm not paying you until you finish my roof. Her boss was a lawyer at the time. And so he made a phone call and said, get out there and finish the roof. Um, they demanded more money. The roofer demanded more money. She said no again. And then he started threatening her and saying, if you don't leave me alone and stop calling me to finish your roof. And this is a direct quote, so I'm going to read it for you. I'm going to tag out a lien on your shack and take it. He also threatened my client's husband um, that if he ever heard from him again, that he would beat him. Um, he said, I know where you live. And so anyway, to make a very long story short, um, my client paid the workers that came to her house um, because she, that when they did do some of the work, she paid for food and beverages for them because the roofer wasn't paying for them to eat. She paid for the interior damage to her home, and she also paid to have the workers clean up the debris that, that they had left. Um, we, I filed a lawsuit on her behalf, and we got a judgment for $250,000, which is more than our house is worth, and that's why you should use the DTPA when possible. Okay, so let's go to statutes of repose. Um, basically, the difference between a statute of limitation and a statute of repose, for those of you who don't know, is that it's kind of like a start date versus a cutoff date. So the statute of limitation begins when like a wrongful act occurs or, and, you know, and it can be extended by the plaintiff being, you know, not at capacity. So if the plaintiff is a minor, the statute doesn't run until they not, are not a minor or the statute of limitation can be extended, for example, under the discovery rule. And what I mean by that is, well, it's been more than two years since I was injured, but I didn't know that I was injured because my injury had not yet you know, come to fruition. Um, a statute of repose is the date that the action is cut off. So what that means is if you, in a construction defect setting, 
it would be 10 years from the date of the substantial completion of the project that you could file suit, or in a products liability case, it's 15 years from the date that the product was first sold. So again, if your statute of limitation um, has expired, you know, also be thinking about statutes of repose, statutes of repose, pardon me. Also be thinking about how COVID can help you. Um, COVID has allowed the state of Texas um, and the Supreme Court to basically toll the statutes of limitation that have arisen during COVID-19. So between March 13th and September 15th, excuse me, March 13th and August 1st, um, if there is a statute of limitation that expires during that time frame, they are extended until September 15th. Um, that also, in my opinion, if you read it, um, the way I read that, it says any deadline for the filing or service of any civil case. So it doesn't say statute of limitation. So I would argue that this also applies to statutes of repose. Now, this is the 18th emergency order. I will tell you that the 19th emergency order came out. That was the order that canceled the bar exam. Bar exam was not a friend of mine, so I wish that would have happened when I was taking the bar, but it didn't. The 20th order that has come out is um, the order that deals with evictions. And so tomorrow we're supposed to get a 21st order. And I would venture to say, although do not quote me or, you know, take my word for this, but I wouldn't be surprised if the statutes of limitation or repose or deadlines as the rule calls them are extended again. So that should come out tomorrow. Okay, bad B movie number five. So DBAT sent me this case and said, hey, you know, this involves a loan totaling $20,000. Um, basically, our client didn't pay the loan back. He's unable to pay the loans. He's lost his home. He's lost his cars, like a country music song. And we, we don't know if this is a very good case. However, it looks like the statute of limitations may have run already. So as I told you, DBAP is really good at like, checking statutes of limitation and finding loopholes for you. So I said, sure, I'll take on the case. And um, one of the things that I found, this other fun thing about doing consumer cases is that you have to be kind of creative. And so I find statutes and causes of action that I didn't even know existed. Um, and so I did not realize that the inaction to enforce the obligation to pay a note um, actually is six years after the due date. And so, you know, she had not, uh, the, the woman that was suing my client had not figured that out yet, but I figured it out. And so unfortunately, I realized that even though she hadn't alleged it yet, she could at any moment. Um, and so I didn't share that with her, but I did take on the representation. And I basically made the longest settlement payment plan in history. Um, and it was three years long in order for him to pay his debt back. And now, of course, I didn't make the deal where he had to pay the whole debt back because she was charging ridiculous interest rates. And so I made a deal with the lawyer who the, the bank was represented by an attorney um, that he would pay $10,000 back over the course of three years, which um, if you're counting at $350 a month takes 28 months. And I will tell you that every single month I wrote him a letter and I reminded him about his payment and every single payment he made on time. And then after two and a half years, he sent me a thank you note in the mail. Um, and I still have it to this day. And that's, that's the fun thing about these consumer cases is I've gotten lots of really cool gifts from my clients. Okay, for you young lawyers or you older lawyers like me that don't get to try cases, this is a great way to try a case. And um, I have found that people are people, meaning the judge, um, are more sympathetic when they know you're representing the client pro bono and when they know you haven't tried a case yet. So don't be scared. Uh, it's a fun way to get some experience. So what are some resources that I use or that I recommend you use? Well, first of all, my client Gabriela Gomez, who hired the roofer, she actually called the BBB, the Better Business Bureau, before she uh, retained me. And found out that the roofer was not licensed. And so of course, when I sent my demand to him, I included that in my demand. So um, if you don't have time to do all this, have your client help you, a, a resource is your client. 
um, Mrs. Meters in my really bad B movie about the car that got into the accident, the T-bone, the other car uh, with the guy that was shot, she actually called and got the police report herself. And so um, if your office is smaller or you're, you know, light on people right now because of COVID or just because you're a smaller firm, I would encourage you to have your clients do those things. Um, public data, my paralegal explained to me, who's awesome, and I would encourage you to rely on your paralegal because they do, or at least mine does, great investigative work. Um, it's a $15 a month subscription and you can get 600 lookups. And so it's not free, but it's not in the grand scheme of things that expensive. Um, Google is something that we all use. However, I will tell you that you would be surprised that we will use a service like a TLO, for example, in my law firm, which is like a background check light. Um, and I, I have a real world example in my TLO that I did of somebody, he had a criminal charge against him in a trial and it didn't show up in the TLO, but it did show up on Google. So um, just remember, don't underestimate Google. Spokio is good if you're in a bind for needing like a telephone number or an address, um, reverse phone lookup. And lastly, online county records, Dallas County or Collin, depending on where you are, um, has a lot of good information. So let's make a deal. Um, I love settling cases. I think I'm good at it. And it's really fun doing it in a consumer law setting for a pro bono client because guess what? Lots of people don't have any money. And so um, there are different ways you can settle cases. And so like the payment plan that took three years but worked um, in the real business world, most people would never agree to that. The pro bono world is different. Um, you can offer, you know, maybe negotiate points if you're, you know, going up against a hotel or some sort of hospitality establishment. Um, improving credit, like what I did with Mrs. Meters. I made the other side help me fix her credit because that was really more important to her at the end of the day than getting any money back. Um, getting deposits back, like the deposit that I got back for Latoya Smith. Um, getting rebates, discounts, things like that, equitable remedies. I find that for most of these pro bono clients, they're really not looking for money. They're looking as, at, at how to get out of a bad situation that they got themselves into by accident. And so um, making a deal can be fun and does not have to involve money. So since we are doing a COVID themed presentation, I thought you should be cautioned when you should stay six feet away from a pro bono client that might want your help in a consumer law case. Um, oftentimes they don't have paperwork. For example, in my Bad, Bo Bad B movie number three case, which was the car wreck um, and the shooting, she had no agreement with this guy that he was going to quote unquote take over her payments and transfer the title into her name, excuse me, his name. Um, that was unfortunately one of the reasons why I had to settle the case because that was sort of a no-go and was was an obstacle in our recovery. Um, family members like to come with pro bono clients. So Mrs. Meters, which is the car wreck case, would come to every single meeting with her son because her son would drive her. And what you have to be careful about is understanding that you're representing Mrs. Meters or I'm representing Mrs. Meters, I'm not representing her son. And so sometimes the family member has the best interest of the client at heart and sometimes they don't, but Beyond that, there is no privilege if you are talking to two people at the same time. So I try to, uh, or if I'm just talking to her son, a lot of times her son would call me and want to talk to me and I would have to remind everybody that I'm representing the mom. So um, just remember that. Um, again, I'm not saying you don't take the case. I'm saying just keep your distance and make sure you're advising your client appropriately. Um, sometimes pro bono clients have co-signers um, that are a friend and may have a, an interest in the outcome of the case. And so be aware, for example, in my case with Ms. Meters, she had somebody else sign the note for her because her credit was bad. In my Latoya Smith case, um, there was no co-signer, even though in my opinion, there should have been. So just kind of keep that in mind that sometimes there's a friend involved and you wanna make sure that those interests are protected and resolved at the same time that you resolve your client's case. Obviously, the recoverability of a defendant is an issue. A lot of these people, whether it's your client or if you're the plaintiff, the other side doesn't have anything to recover from. 
Um, that is something that you should figure out up front because it's not, I don't wanna say it's not worth taking the case, but you're gonna to have to tell your client the recoverability is an issue and, and may ultimately result in nothing. Um, to that same note, um, make sure if you don't have any insurance background, of which I have a lot of, that if you're drafting a petition, that you do not argue your client out of insurance coverage, meaning that if the defendant has insurance, that's your money pot. And if you don't draft your petition correctly, then you may not trigger the insurance. So that's another thing. That's why a mentoring attorney is a good idea. I've actually had a specific conversation with another attorney in Dallas taking on a consumer law case who called me and I explained to him how to, how to make sure the insurance is triggered. And, and also how to figure out whether there is insurance and you know how to get to the bottom of that sort of sometimes black hole. Um, the other thing is, you know, proof of payment, purchase orders, invoices, leases, notes, all of those things are things that sometimes pro bono clients just don't have. Um, the thing I've seen a lot of is the back of a contract. So they have the first page of the contract, but oftentimes the back side of the contract is where all the fine print is. And it's really important for you to make sure that you have um, the full copy of the paperwork. The other thing um, that I would basically caution you to not be cautious about is some of your pro bono clients are not going to be legal citizens. And that means they don't have the proper paperwork documenting their citizenship and that's okay. And guess what, it's not admissible. And so sometimes the other side likes to take a deposition and start asking those questions and I shut them down immediately. It's not admissible. It has absolutely no bearing on whether they can recover and it cannot be mentioned. Okay, so when do you wanna either shut your pro bono case down potentially decline to take it. Um, first of all, DVAP is amazing at making sure those pro bono clients call you. And so they have a duty to call you first, just so you know you're not hunting anybody down. Um, case in point, I accepted a bilingual consumer law case from Whitney, that's the DVAP paralegal, earlier this week or last week during the will, I think it was during the clinic I accepted it. Anyway, um, once he got my phone number, Mr. De Los Santos must have called me six times in the same day. So that is what they're supposed to do. And if they are not responding to you, then you have the ability to talk to DVAP and they will allow you to close down your case. Um, questionable reporting of income. What do I mean by that? Well, um, my client, uh, I will not name the name, um, but I handled a pro bono case, consumer law case for, for the client. And I was asked by this client, this happens sometimes, to help this client on another case, a new case. And when I went out to the person's house, I recognized that there was a discrepancy in the amount of income they appeared to be reporting versus how they were living their life, uh, meaning their cars and handbags were nicer than mine. And while some people are house, you know, house poor and personal property rich, it just didn't sit right with me. And so I told DVAP, I said, I just have a little bit of a concern that this person is not really in need of pro bono assistance. And there are so many people who are in need that I just wanted to work with somebody else. And DVAP was really supportive and agreed that we didn't need to take that case. Um, your own personal safety, I will tell you that the Rico Suave's cousin, the used car sales manager and my Mary Meters case, um, threatened me a couple times, threatened my client a couple of times. And so again, um, I actually told our office manager that um, this is a photo of what he looks like. If he comes into our office, um, he is not to be let in. And so if you, get, if you get to a point where you are feeling uncomfortable, talk to DVAP and you know, nobody's going to expect you to continue on with that case. So we are now to Bad B movie number six. It is our last Bad B movie. And it's a way I like to end the presentation. So Mr. R.D. Leggins was my client, 87 years old. He had a disabled grandson who had his car repossessed. Um, and when they repossessed the car, it was at his grandfather's house. This is not his house or his car, by the way. Um, and the repo company totally damaged the gas pipes. And so the city condemned the home, the city of Dallas condemned his home and cut off his gas because of the damage to the gas pipes. So they had no gas to cook with, no gas to keep warm or bathe. And this is starting on Christmas Eve all the way through January 25th. So for one month, they used propane tanks. And ironically, I'm getting chills telling you this because it's just so sad. 
um, inside of their home to heat their home during the Christmas season. And not only does the grandson walk with a cane, but also the grandfather walks with a cane. So Mr. Leggins took it upon himself to be very resourceful, that's my client, and he actually sued the car dealership and the repo company. Um, the dealership never showed up, and so he got a default judgment against the car dealership. And then the car dealership um, filed an appeal, okay, and didn't show up to the appeal. And so my client won the appeal. Um, and so then the dealership filed a motion for a new trial in front of Mark Greenberg and Dallas County Court at Law Number Five. And my office represented Mr. Leggins at the motion for a new trial. And during the hearing, we won. The motion for a new trial was denied. But the car dealer asked in open court if he could fire his lawyer, because he was represented as well, and hire me, which was very funny. Um, and he was very serious about it because after I got back to my office, the next day he called me and, and assigned a new file to me, which I had a conflict and I couldn't take. But um, you might even get business out of doing consumer law cases. So um, that is really it for me. I am available here for the next 15 minutes to answer questions that you may have. And I am sort of new at answering questions, but I think I can figure out how to look at them. Okay, uh, what's the CLE number is what I was asked. Oh, and then Mary Sally, you've already responded. Um, it looks like I don't have any more questions, but I am here for, let's see, 14 more minutes. I told you I would keep you on time. Um, so please let me know if, if there's anything you wanna ask me, I am available. Oh, I have a Q&A. Hold, please. Thanks, I bought a phone from a person. Okay, thank you. Yes, so the question from um, one of our one of our panelists and guests is, can I share a sample demand letter? Actually, I can. I have one on my computer, um, and I don't know um, if you want me to share it right now or if you would rather me, if, if let me do this, my, let me do this, so that I, not everybody probably wants the demand letter. If you would like a sample demand letter, please contact me, my information, is on the PowerPoint, it's the very last slide. <clears throat> um, if, you, if you can't see it anymore, my email address is khayden, like my name, K-H-A-Y-D-E-N at Cozen, and that's spelled C-O-Z-E-N.com. I would be happy to send you a demand letter um, from one of my cases. Oh, here's some more Q&A. Is there a code that we need to report? Um, Maricela, you might wanna respond because somebody was asking if there was a code that we need to report. And I know that you provided that on the chat yes. line, not on the Q&A line. Okay. Um, okay, so I have a couple of questions here. For newly licensed attorneys, other than the pitfalls that you've listed, what are some immediate things you believe are necessary to handle these types of matters. Um, an O'Connor's Causes of Action book, you can handle these. And I really feel like, um, I, I mean, I would make sure that you're, if you're a newly licensed attorney, which is the question that this came from, I would make sure that there's somebody in your firm that can mentor you, that can look over a draft of a lawsuit for you. Again, if you don't have those, um, then you can use the mentoring attorneys that DVAP provides. So, Let's see. Um, second question. When filing a consumer case, any thoughts on filing in JP court versus that district or county court? So I think it depends on um, obviously the amount of money that's involved. If it's less than $10,000, you have no choice. You have to file in JP court. Um, but typically I allege DTPA and it amps up the damages. And I, I always like to amp up the damages because I think it sends a signal that your case is worth more. 
Um, so it's almost like you're admitting that your case is worth less than $10,000 if you file it in JP court. So I'm not suggesting that you come up with fraudulent damages, um, but some cases you just have to file in JP court, like my trespassing tree situation, that was like a $500 issue. Obviously I'm not gonna file that in, in district court. Um, but I think that sometimes you can get more traction in district court only because it's not as busy. Um, and again, you're able to seek more damages. So I think it, it depends on kind of what your time frame is. And um, you know, when you go to JP court, a lot of times you're sitting there for four hours before your case is called. But I have done both. Um, and I think it just kind of depends on the facts of your case. While you took these cases pro bono, did you get attorney's fees? I did not get, a, I got attorney's fees awarded, but I did not recover those attorney's fees. Um, and that I actually have asked our pro bono coordinator that question. We have a pro bono coordinator nationally for our law firm. And my understanding is that while I can get an award of attorney's fees, I'm, to, I'm doing the case pro bono. So I would not get those fees back or our law firm would decline to take the fees. But that also may be my law firm's position. Um, DVAP may be able to answer that question a little bit better. Next question, did the roofer with $250,000 um, have money or insurance to pay? The answer, unfortunately, is no, he did not. Um, he was not licensed. And so um, he had also kind of like skipped town. So unfortunately, she had a really pretty piece of paper that I, and I explained to her how to renew the judgment every 10 years, which you have to do in Dallas County, if you want your judgment lien to stay good. So um, unfortunately, he may have money now, but he did not have money when I got that judgment. Does ZVAP provide mentors for consumer law cases if I accept a case? The answer is yes, they do, and I am one of them. Please remember that Justice Court will be going up to $20,000 shortly. Thank you, Mark Snyder, for telling me that. So for those of you who heard me wrong earlier, the JP Court is only $10,000. It shortly will be increasing to $20,000. And thank you, David Ritter, also, for telling me that as well. So the other benefit in doing these cases is you also will learn something as well. Um, attendee Anonymous, do you have more specifics on what to avoid in a pleading when it comes to triggering insurance coverage for the opposing party? Are you referring to a fraud claim? Since I understand insurance coverages often exclude that. Seems that many of the pro bono claims center around fraud. So wondering if you mean that or something else. No, I was not referencing that. I was more referencing um, that there are, you know, certain tricks of the trade to triggering insurance. Um, so basically a general liability policy requires there to be property damage or personal injury. So again, I don't want you to fabricate things in your lawsuit, um, but if you're only talking about a monetary loss, for example, because of a failed contract, that probably isn't going to trigger insurance coverage. Now, this is just one example of many um, that I could tell you about um, in the contracting setting, meaning a general contractor or a roofer that you might be suing. Um, there are certain exclusions for an insured's work. And again, that's a whole different, we could have a whole seminar on just that exclusion, but that's why I recommend working with a mentoring attorney or working with a lawyer in your firm that has some insurance background um, to make sure that you are using insurance if it's available. One thing that a lot of people don't know is a default judgment in Texas, once it becomes final and non-appealable, the insurance company for the defendant against whom the default judgment was rendered does not have a duty to defend the insured because that delay of the judgment being both final and non-appealable means that there's prejudice as a matter of law under Texas law. So let me use my roofer example. In the case where I got the $250,000 judgment, that default judgment should be forwarded to the insurance company. In our case, there was no insurance um, before the judgment becomes final and non-appealable. It becomes final 30 days after you get it. Um, and then there's, a, there's multiple app appellate deadlines, but I would do it as soon as possible um, because an insurance company may have a defense to paying the judgment if you don't let them know immediately. Okay, another question is, 
Can you explain how federal statutes such as FCRA work with renewing an unpaid judgment every 10 years in Texas? Would renewing the judgment and reporting it to the consumer reporting agencies violate the seven year limit on debts and judgments? Um, now, Claudia, that is a very good question that I do not know the answer to, but um, because we have a practice that focuses on that in my firm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, write your question down. I don't know how to screenshot it. And if you email me, I will email you back the answer. So the question from Claudia is federal statutes, um, how do they work with renewing the judgments in Texas every 10 years? Um, because there's a seven year limit on debts and judgments. Okay. Okay, somebody's telling me thank you. Claudia is gonna email me. So far, I think I've answered all the questions. Um, I've now- We have one more question in the chat box, uh, Kendall, before you get off. Um, it says, for discovery, do you have a list of vendors who will provide free services for pro bono matters? That's a really good, oh, hi, Donnie. Donnie works with my firm. Um, and Donnie, thank you for coming to this for the second year in a row because he already heard this presentation last year. So I have not found somebody that has a protocol for pro bono discovery. However, I have done it on a case-by-case -case basis. And in my tree case, for example, um, the arborist that was my expert witness was actually the arborist that planted the trees in my yard. Uh, which three of which died. So I, you know, use that to get my guy to do it for free. So I would negotiate with people. Um, I have also gotten an expert witness um, and I'm forgetting what type of expert it was. It was a roofing expert and he agreed because our law firm uses him so often to go out and look at a roof for me um, free of charge. So I, I can tell you that at least my experts have been willing to do it. I would venture to say some court reporters may do that. I think the only difference is, is that, you know, they're creating a product, meaning a transcript, um, and somebody has to pay for that, whereas mine were more advice driven, and so it's a little bit easier for them to do that in their own time. But DVAP may have a list of vendors that do that, and so I'm kind of pitching this back to DVAP. There may be a service out there that does do discovery um, at, a, at no charge. So, FYI. And I think we have time for one last question um, by William Stort. If a defendant does not want to inform their insurance company, should you as the plaintiff do so? Absolutely. The key is you may not know who the insurance company is. Um, so you're going to have to send discovery to get that information. There's also a case in Texas called Crocker. And it's not a very good case because what it basically says, um, it's a I think it's a Fifth Circuit case, or is it a Texas Supreme Court case? Anyway, it's a Texas case. And um, Crocker basically says that the named insured has to put the insurance company on notice. Um, and so even if you know about a case, even if you are an additional insured and you tell the insurance company that there is a lawsuit pending, Crocker says the insurance company does not have a duty to defend that. Now, I don't think that's something that I advise my insurance clients to follow but there is a case out there that suggests it's got to be the named insured that tells the insurance company. Most insurance companies don't abide by that, that I deal with anyway, but you should know that that's out there. Um, and so I, you should notify them, but just understand that there's a case out there, if they rely on that, that may give you some trouble. All right, I think that's all the questions, Kendall. Um, if you have any last notes before we hang up for today, thank you again for speaking and giving such a wonderful presentation. You are so welcome, and thank you for Cozen O'Connor for attending my presentation, and everybody else, please email me if I can answer any more questions for you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day.